Passing a bill takes all of us and the momentum to build a movement in Massachusetts around this issue is sparked by so many who've shown so much dedication and energy, including Carmen Eliber, Lori Bassinger, Ann Bureau, Shakira Robinson, Lori Johnson, and so many others I'm sure I've left out, and the hundreds of survivors and advocates who are mobilizing right now to build awareness of and prevent coercive control. Today's meeting will be recorded and ASL and CART captioning will be available to all participants. Our speakers will be spotlit for all and please practice Zoom etiquette by muting yourself if you are not speaking. And feel free to change your name, camera setting, depending on your comfort. It's the request of our, our ASL interpreters and captioners that you keep your video on video mute uh, to just reduce the number of squares that are appearing on screen. And with that, I am thrilled to welcome our first speaker, our, um, the illustrious Dr. Lisa Fontes, is an internationally known expert on child abuse, intimate partner abuse, sexual violence, and culture. As a researcher, activist, expert witness, and author, she works to protect vulnerable people from violence. Her most recent book is Invisible Chains, Overcoming Coercive Control in Your Intimate Relationship. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, where she teaches adult students who want to finish their bachelor's degree online. Dr. Fontes is a popular conference speaker and blogs for publications, including domesticshelters.org and psychologytoday.com, where she has millions of readers. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Fontes. Thank you so much, Hema. Thank you to all the organizers from Jane Doe Inc. and the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute who made this event happen. And thank you very much to all of you who are attending today. I know that you have busy lives and busy work lives, and I'm really grateful um, that you're here with us. So I'm going to dive right in. I want to start, as I always do when I speak about coercive control, by thanking Evan Stark. Evan Stark wrote the first book on coercive control, which was called Coercive Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life. It is brilliant. It set the path for all of us. And I hear he's coming out with a new edition soon. When I read this, I it really helped me collect a lot of dots, um, sorry, connect a lot of dots for myself and others. And I wanted to find ways to make this material available to a broader public. Um, his book is um, very, it, it's a bit academic, and so it can be a hard read. So I wrote the second book ever on coercive control, which is called Invisible Chains, Overcoming Coercive Control in Your Intimate Relationship. It's designed to be accessible, both in terms of the price and in terms of the writing, and it's been translated into several languages, including Spanish. Um, and I have Evan's blessing on that. So let me tell you what our plan is for our brief time today. I'm going to be talking about the differences between psychological or emotional abuse and coercive control and domestic violence or domestic abuse. I'll be outlining the tactics of course of control, the effects that it has on adults and children. Then uh, Jamie Sabino will be talking about course of control and the law in Massachusetts. And Mayling Ellerman will be talking about course of control in communities of color. And then we reckon we really welcome your questions and comments, which you can put in the Q&A um, right now as we go um, and um, are very apt Colleagues from Jane Doe Inc. are going to be collecting them and reading them for us. So what's the difference between psychological abuse and course of control? Psychological abuse could be one really severe incident. It could be multiple incidents. It could all be of one type. So for instance, maybe a, a partner insults their partner day and night. Well, that's only one type of psychological abuse. It's terrible, um, but that doesn't qualify as course of control. 
it could be ongoing. So it could be over time or there could be uh, isolated incidents. In other words, one really bad episode of, um, you know, screaming, insulting and so on would count as psychological abuse. Course of control is a little different. Course of control consists of numerous incidents in a multi-pronged pronged strategy. In other words, there are different kinds, different types of abuse going on. It happens over time. And that's one reason it is so devastating to people is that it may happen over a period of months, years, even decades, and can really change how a person feels about themselves and about the wor world. Course of control can include physical, emotional, economic, sexual, legal, and other forms of abuse, and the victim feels quite trapped. Um, so in the 80s, um, and some of you were active then, and thank you um, for what you did, what you've done, um, we began to define domestic violence by episodes of violence. Now, advocates have always known that there's a lot more going on there, okay? Advocates know what's what. But we needed the police, we thought we needed the police and the courts to take seriously when a woman's bone gets broken in the home or she gets punched in the face, that is as serious as an assault that happens in the bar, in a bar, let's say, or on the street. Um, so in the public mind, people began to equate domestic violence with episodes of physical violence. Coercive control is a whole different way of looking at the situation. It's much more global. So looking at using the course of control model, we say there's a whole universe of ways one person can dominate their partner. And a part of that is episodes of violence. Sometimes course of control doesn't even have episodes of violence, but all the other tactics of controlling a person can be really devastating as well. So that other stuff, those other tactics are not merely unpleasant. Course of control deprives people of their basic human rights to freedom of association, getting together with who they want, when they want, and movement, and the right to live in safety and without fear. Um, so this is the universe of course of control. Um, it can include tactics like isolating, abusing sexually, intimidating, economic abuse, verbal abuse, stalking, abusing through technology, abusing physically, manipulating, controlling through the children, and micromanaging, and more. We could think about course of control as being the episode, the, sorry, the torment between reportable um, domestic violence incidents. In other words, if there is an assault on January 1st that gets reported to the police, let's say, and there's another big assault on July 1st, it's not that nothing happened between January 1st and July 1st. Lots of domination happened, and that is course of control. And as I said, sometimes there is no physical violence present. Um, every tactic that we see on that list also harms children. So we can think of course of control as a strategy that some people use to control another person. It does appear in other settings other than in couples. You can see it sometimes in the military, in basic training, in sports where a trainer or coach might control their athlete. Sometimes it works, work in cults, elderly people and people with disabilities are especially vulnerable. But with intimate partners, it's 24 seven. It's special because we invest all of our hopes and our dreams in our intimate relationships a lot of the time. And we'll, people will do anything, especially women will do anything to make it work. We do see course of control in same sex couples and people of all genders can be both victimized or victimizers. However, in heterosexual couples, the research shows that it is more often men over women. And I have a lot I could say about gender. We won't have time, but feel free to ask it in the question and answer period if you want. I do want to say that most men would never control their partners this way. So coercive control is not sort of typical kinds of bossiness. We're talking about something different here. Let's start with the acts of love, which is also called love bombing, because nobody enters a relationship thinking that they're going to be controlled. They enter because of the feelings of romance and connection that are often really prominent in the beginning. 
Course of control relationships typically start in some kind of whirlwind, and there's intense pressure initially for sex and for commitment. People tell me, he said, I love you within the first two weeks. They tell me, we moved in within a month. I was pregnant by my eighth week. So um, I didn't even like him at the beginning, but he kept telling me he loved me. So I felt like I had to go out with him. So there's this feeling from the future abuser of, of owning their partner very early. Um, a lot of times that will include isolation, which we'll talk about. Abusers act affectionate and romantic to keep their partners in the relationship at a later point. So if the person who's being victimized, you know, is like, this is too much, I'm out of here, this isn't really what I want, they'll take out the wedding album, or they'll take her out to a nice meal, give her flowers, and um, it promise to change and that things will be different. So this leads to that intense trauma, trauma bond. Um, maybe you've heard about intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement is why people keep going back to those slot machines, because most of the time you don't get anything, but every once in a while you get something big. It's why we keep checking email and Facebook all the time, because on the chance that once in a while we'll get something good. So without knowing what they're doing, abusers will give these occasional hits of love and romance, which will make someone um, stay in the relationship. Evan Stark talks about occasional indulgences. So occasionally, of course, you can go spend the weekend with your sister, which makes someone think, oh, well, I'm really, I guess I'm not that trapped. Um, I, I know that for some people, the cycle of violence is a very helpful model. And if it's helpful to you, that's great. Um, I like to think of it instead as being more like a toolbox of tools that the abuser uses to control their partner. And each tool is a tactic. So they can take out the acts of love, they can take out the physical violence and use those to dominate their partner. One of the big red flags or one of the big hallmarks of course of control is isolation. So the abuser will separate the target from their family, their friends and their coworkers. And this can happen in a lot of different ways. They can physically move them to another community or another country or into the suburbs or somewhere where they're further away from people they know. They can um, tell them that they can't stay, uh, can't work, or they can't stay after work and socialize with other people. They may take away their phone when they come home and say, after work is my time. They may get drunk every time the friends come over. And so the friends don't want to come over or they make a pass at the friends or they're revealing the secret thoughts of others. You know, honey, you think that your sister really likes you, but she looked at you funny or she told me this or that. So over time, the person who's being targeted feels more and more alone. It can ruin a person's friendships and their uh, reputation. Um, so other people won't want to hang out with them. And a lot of times the isolation is packaged as caring. Darling, I don't want you to go to English classes because you're sitting next to people you don't know, and I don't feel good about that. Um, but the caring over time is making the person feel more and more isolated. So that when a person is victimized and they try to get away or they try to reestablish themselves, they may really feel very much alone. They're cut off from their family. They don't have friends or they haven't spoken to their friends in a long time. And they may be even isolated in their ethnic or religious community. Economic abuse is huge in course of control. Can the abuser may- Lisa, would yes. you change interpreters right now? Could you please okay. give us a moment? Waiting for the interpreter to change. Ready? Proceed, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, so economic abuse is a tactic, of course, of control. The abuser may not allow the victim to work or may force her to turn over her earnings. She may be put on an allowance. You, this is the only money you have to pay for the home, to pay for the kids, to, to pay for our food. Money is often used to threaten, to reward and punish. And you can see that in low-income families and in wealthy families. The abuser will um, reward when the victim is doing what he wants and will cut off access to money um, when she's not, which can be very 
upsetting if you're at the gas pump and it, it doesn't work anymore, or you go, you have a cart full of groceries and your children and you can't uh, buy them because there's no money on the card. Abusers will typically ruin the credit of the person they're victimizing. They may steal from them um, directly, steal objects, uh, put their name. I know one case where someone put his name on a patent that his victim had, had gotten. Um, when he had nothing to do with its development. They, abusers often require victims to pay for their schooling, their equipment, their car, and say they're going to repay them back, but then they don't. After a divorce or separation, abusers will frequently try to claim everything and often do some you know, back dealing to get um, pretty much everything. Um, I always tell people to go to the to contact the credit uh companies to make sh to put a block on a temporary block on their credit so their abuser cannot um coerce them into loans or or take money out in their name Vic victims may be impoverished and unable to afford adequate counsel a decent lawyer when they're divorcing or separating and dealing with custody um and it may take a couple years later till they realize wait I agreed to a deal that doesn't work for me or doesn't work for my kids. Manipulating is a common tactic, of course, of control. Uh, some ways to manipulate another person include lying. Um, abusers lie about their identity. They lie about how much money they have. They withhold information. Um, they withhold passports. They withhold documents. Um, they don't allow the person who's being victimized privacy. Um, I know women who weren't allowed to close the door when they went to the bathroom. Uh, very commonly, abusers will not will demand the password of their victims and um, be reading all their emails, their texts, their messaging, and so forth. Um, the silent treatment is a way to manipulate another person. So the victim knows that if she does something that displeases the abuser, Maybe she doesn't agree to sex or, or, or question something. He won't talk to her for a period of time. There are mind games, um, gaslighting, um, telling the victim that she's crazy. She's overly sensitive. She's hysterical. She's the, actually the abuser. And then you can see tests of loyalty as well. Well, if you really loved me, if this family was really important to you, you wouldn't go to, you wouldn't have friends, you wouldn't have a club, you wouldn't go and sing in the choir, you would stay home with us. So she's constantly got to prove her loyalty. And then something which I call provoke and record, which you can Google, which is the way, and I see this more and more today, it's the way an abuser may provoke the victim and then tape her record her with his phone or with hidden cameras, and then try to use that to pretend that the abuser is actually the victim. Um, and it seems to be more and more common. Um, I say to people who are being victimized, really try to control your anger. And your abuser may try to provoke you while you're in the kitchen. It seems to be a new thing. So you'll turn around with a knife and you'll be recorded and that will be used against you in court. Uh, micromanaging and setting rules is really common in course of control. The abuser may have rules about time. I want you to document how you spend every 15 minutes because you should be getting more done. They may have rules about clothing, about how often she's allowed to shower or bathe. They may have rules about uh, what the victim can eat, about using the toilet, about the internet, where they can go on the internet, which friends they can hang out with, how they talk, cooking, cleaning, how they sleep, how they should walk on the street. The list goes on and on. Now, why would an abuser bother with all these little details? It's a way of asserting dominance. That's the key here. The abuser defines what it means to be in a relationship or married or to love each other. So the person who's being victimized um, is like, okay, I guess, you know, I guess I shouldn't oppose what he says because that I'm a wife and that's not part of what I do. And um, these definitions become very confusing for people um, because over time, if you've 
kind of assimilated them as that's what it means to be in a relationship, then you start suppressing all of your individual personal yearnings and desires, which of course are human. Um, after separation, abusers will typically micromanage children's care, their clothing, their schooling, etc. Stalking. I just love this illustration of stalking by Liz Banish. It's stalking is a series of behaviors directed at a specific person designed to make that person feel fear. It happens both within relationships and after relationships. And this is what it feels like, like you're tied to somebody that is invisible to everybody else, but you feel their presence at all times. Stalking usually occurs in several spheres. So the person may not be allowed to go out alone. The abuser may search their computer, their phone, their car, their clothes, their drawers, their diary, their receipts. They may have GPS on the car, on their phone, and so on. May put a microphone in the children's uh, toys. They may directly follow the person or they may have somebody else follow them, which is called proxy stalking. Stalking is unpredictable. There's no clear ending, which can be uh, really disturbing. Maybe six months have gone by and there you haven't seen any stalking incidents, so you think it's over with and then it starts up again. The individual incidents may seem mild to others. So maybe someone walks outside her apartment and there's a rose on her mat. Well, other people may think that's sweet or romantic. But if someone is being stalked, that can be really terrifying. Technology, unfortunately, makes um, new kinds of abuse possible. Um, people can be stalked online. Their reputation can be ruined through social media. Abusers will manipulate smartphones, so the um, alarm goes off in the middle of the night, so the heat goes on in the summer, um, and uh, sextortion, of course, threatening to release photos or videos of the person, give to send them to their family, to their bosses, and so on. Verbal abuse is usually a part, of course, of control. Many types of verbal abuse, including belittling somebody, making it seem as if their needs are not important, criticizing them, humiliating them. Verbal abuse is not simply nastiness. So sometimes people say nasty things to each other in a relationship. Not such a great idea, but in course of control, it's the effects of it are much worse. The person is of more vulnerable because they're isolated um, and therefore they don't have other people to reflect back to them how terrific they are. They're dependent on the abuser's approval. Uh, verbal abuse is usually one way in course of control. It's often very severe or very frequent. And it's not just when the abuser is angry, it's used to suppress conflict and restrict the victim's freedom. Lisa, we're going to switch interpreters. One moment, please. You may proceed. Thank you. So intimidation is big in course of control. The abuser may stomp around, slam doors, throw things, hurt pets, drive fast, get in their partner's face, break things that are precious to them, and it just creates an atmosphere of fear, of fear, which the adult victim feels, and so do the children in the home. Verbal threats are a particular group of uh, ways to threaten another people, and we, person, and we need to pay, pay special attention to suicidal threats. Abusers who threaten or attempt suicide are 133% more likely to kill their partners or their ex-partners than other abusers. And mortal threats, abusers who threaten to kill their ex-partners or their partners are 15 times more likely to kill them than other abusers. And these threats may not be, I'm going to kill you. It may be, um, your children won't see you anymore. Um, it may be, accidents might happen. Um, those would be mortal threats. What's the relationship between physical violence and course of control? Physical violence is just one tactic, and it's not used by all coercively controlling people. 
The physical violence in course of control is often what we call mild. In other words, it doesn't leave bruises or doesn't leave broken bones, but frequent. So pushing, slaps, grabbing, shaking, pulling hair, grabbing somebody by the hair, deliberately rough sex to cause pain. Um, the, in many couples, there's constant mild violence, but occasional um, severe violence. 95% of domestic violence assaults are mild. If you wait for the broken bones, you're going to miss the assaults. In 40% of couples with domestic violence, the abuser assaults several times a week or even daily. But as I said, course of control can exist in couples without any physical violence. I do want to call special attention to the issue of strangling or smothering. Even a brief partial strangulation can lead to lasting physical and psychological damage. The external bruising may be slight, and victims often discount the physically and emotionally traumatic experience, saying that they're not really hurt, and they fail to document the abuse. Even fewer seek medical attention, but any kind of smothering or strangling or grabbing by the neck is severe. Um, it's shockingly common, um, smothering and strangulation. And I was speaking with someone the other day who said, I don't want to call it strangulation. He picked me up by the neck. I said, could you breathe? No, I couldn't breathe. I said, that's strangulation. Course of control exists on a continuum in most couples, calling it a normal relationship for want of a better term. There's some conflicts and there may be some differences in power in certain issues, but overall things are pretty balanced. In course of control relationships, one person dominates the other and deprives the other of resources. The target feels isolated, oppressed, and unfree. And the on the extreme end is what we call course of entrapment, which is extreme control and deprivation of resources and many different tactics of course of control. Victims of course of entrapment lead, live severely reduced lives. So people can fall in different places on that continuum. Sexual coercion, violence, and degradation is a big part of course of control. It often includes sex on demand. So when the abuser wants sex, the victim is expected to provide it um, in the way that he wants. It may include sexual name calling, obligating the victim to have sex with others, forcing sex or rape. Um, in other words, the victim says no, and the abuser proceeds anyway. Uh, forcing the victim to accept the abuser's multiple partners, forcing the victim to expose herself or to um, sell herself, um, using main, deliberately causing pain and humiliation during sex, and recording sex for blackmail. The more I work as an expert witness, the more I see how very common um, sexual coercion and forced sexual pain are in course of control. And it's very hard to talk about. Refusing contraception is also a form of sexual abuse. Abusive litigation um, are legal acts to exert power, force contact, and financially burden an ex-partner. There's the constant stress of going to court, taking time off work, arranging transportation and childcare, and having to confront the abuser face-to-face -face in court. Um, so vexatious litigation is uh, frivolous lawsuits repeatedly or causing hearings unnecessarily, knowingly falsely reporting child abuse, falsely claiming victimization by the ex-partner, filing motions to vacate protection orders, claims of parental alienation, and so on. Um, we'll be looking at some new proposed legislation in Massachusetts to address abusive, abusive litigation. Children are co-victims of coercive control. And there's this wonderful new book by Emma Katz called Coercive Control in Children's and Mother's Lives, which is based on her research. What are some of the way, ways that children are victimized? And this is a short list from a big problem. Abusers will try to fracture children's relationships with their mothers. They'll engage in what we call counter-parenting. In other words, um, doing the opposite of uh, what the victim wants. 
The victim will say no eating in your room and the abuser will insist that the kids eat in their rooms. That's just one example. Using children to spy on or torment the victim. Harming children's well-being. So deliberately um, making it so children are not getting what they need because they know it bothers their ex. In other words, the desire to hurt the ex is greater than the care for the children. Depriving the children economically. Um, and that can be through depriving the other parent economically so that uh, children are living very close to uh, sometimes homelessness. Um, abusing children sexually or physically to get back at the target. Threatening to take the children and then taking the children after a separation. These are ways in which course of control hurts children. Children also live in fear. And every tactic that an abuser uses against his partner, um, he may use later against the children too. What are some of the effects? Fear, isolation, anxiety, panic, social phobia, low self-esteem, health problems, poor concentration, shame and self-blame, trauma, a feeling of becoming unhinged. And then we see effects in the world as well, including homelessness, addictions, joblessness, suicide, homicide, people being unwilling to cooperate with legal proceedings um, because the abuser seems to always win. Evan Stark calls perspecticide the abuse-induced incapacity to know what you know. And after years or decades in a course of control relationship, the victim does not feel or act like herself. She may feel very confused and that it makes it very hard to, to think clearly initially. Adult and child victims need time and peace to recover. I don't want to lead to the impression that victims um, are passive. Um, they are not. Um, they resist in their own ways. They affirm their humanity. They improve their conditions and get free. And in the process, they become survivors. They find ways to connect with others because, as I said, isolation is the worst. They connect in person. They connect on the internet or phone. They enjoy support, enjoy support groups and therapy. They protect their children. They think secret thoughts. They do hobbies or art. They seek police and legal help. They return to work and school. I know someone who said she signed her kids up for subsidized childcare, and the day they got accepted, she started the process of leaving. They take steps towards leaving, and they do leave. Um, what can we do? It's important to avoid judging or controlling. We offer help. We be patient. We stay in touch. We can ask, what do you need? They may need someone to take care of the cat. They may need money. They may need childcare. They may need just an ear. They may need transportation to their local domestic violence agency. Ask what you can do to help. Ask the person what they want to do and ask what their biggest worry is. Because someone who's worried about being shot is different. Um, than someone with less lethal worries. All worries are important though. Stay in touch, which can be really hard. And of course, help the person contact their local domestic violence agency so they can develop a safety plan. Just wanna say a word about why we need laws on course of control in Massachusetts. Um, we can no longer only look to physical evidence as the means to determine domestic violence. Domestic violence in all its forms should be looked at as a primary factor in determining child custody. Abusive parents should not be awarded shared custody of children unless protective measures have been put in place to ensure the physical safety and psychological well being of the child. And that's a quote from uh, Dr. Christine Cocciola, who said it better than I could say it. So I just quoted her. Um, why should you care about coercive control? It's a better predictor of homicide than previous physical violence. Most masked murderers, including shooters and bombers, practice on their family first. So if we can intervene with domestic violence, we may be able to prevent some of these mass incidents as well. Domestic abusers are increasingly clever about making their victim look like the predominant uh, aggressor and getting, getting custody of the children. Course of control causes victims to do things that are unlike them. So we need to understand it. 
and everyone is entitled to live as a free and autonomous person. Coercive control is a violation of human rights. Um, I really want to thank you um, for being here, and um, I will take, there's my contact information, I'm easy to find on the web, and I will introduce um, our next uh, panelist. Jamie Ann Sabino, attorney, is Deputy Director of Advocacy at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute, a statewide nonprofit poverty law and policy center where she manages the Family Law Task Force and the Civil Legal Aid for Victims of Crime Initiative. So here's Jamie. Thank you very much, Lisa. And every time I hear you speak, I feel like you're speaking truth that we all need to know. I'm not going to take a long time. I'm just going to do a dance through the two statutes that we have pending in the legislature. There were some excellent questions in the chat about possible ways these might be used against survivors which is always the question. I'm going to wait to address those things until we get to the question and answer page. I just wanna say, we heard everything that Lisa had to say. How do we put this into a law? Next, please. The current bill, uh, the act to improve protections relative to domestic violence would actually amend our abuse prevention statute. 209A to add to the current requirements of physical abuse or fear of physical abuse, coercive control, technological abuse. There's also a section on statute of limitations, which we're not going to go into now, um, but about the statute of limitations for domestic violence crimes matching that for sexual assault. I'm just going to talk briefly about the first two. Thank you. The important words are pattern of conduct. Coercive control is a pattern of conduct that does these things that Lisa told us about, uh, restricting individual safety, autonomy, using intimidation, isolation, and it's conduct that compels compliance. The law specifically says conduct undertaken to protect yourself or children from risk of present or future harm is not uh, coercive control. Next, please. The things that Lisa talked about are in the statute, isolating the parent, repeated humiliating, uh, using degradating language or behaviors. And that's something I will come back to because again, people are concerned that that would be used against survivors and it will, but because of the pattern of conduct, it can't be that one-off, awful text that your client sent to somebody after they left. It includes controlling and regulating, um, uh, ooh, I've lost myself, controlling and regulating actions, uh, repeated court actions. And I'll talk a little more about that because we have a separate bill about that, though it is in the coercive control bill. Cleaning, accessing, and waving that gun around for immigrant survivors, threats or deportation or ICE, or I'm not gonna pay for your, uh, or support your application. Um, doing the same about children and parents. Immigration is a big issue. This bill also includes more around technological abuse, which is comes up in 2019 now and is considered, but this is much clearer and again, an actor pattern of behavior to harass, threaten, intimidate, all those things we see people doing. The whole nest thing where they turn people's heat on and off and on and off reminds one of the movie Gaslighting. And technological abuse can be a whole range of things, internet, social networking sites, computers, mobile devices, all the things, much of them I don't even understand how to use, but they're used by abusers. Next, please. There is a second bill on controlling- One moment, Jamie. Yes. We're going to be switching interpreters right now. Perfect. Would you please hold one second? Perfect timing.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is a bill which would add a new chapter, Controlling and Abuse of Litigation Prevention. Next. Abuse is what's in 209A. So if we change 209A, all those things would come into this as well. Controlling and abuse of litigation is where the parties have had a current or former family or household member, and there's a restraining order against one of the people by the filing party, um, or that in the instant case, a judge finds there's been abusive and harassing behavior. So you don't have to have gotten your 209A. I, litigation that's being initiated, advanced, or continued for abusing, harassing, intimidating. You all can read all of this. The statute will be uh, on the JDI website. What is important is that they're dragging people back into court over and over on cases that don't have any standing in law or fact. And more importantly, things that keep getting decided. I will file a complaint to modify every six months. We have a temporary order of parenting time. Every three months, I'm going to move to change that. Next, um, Jamie, yes. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. So we're going to end up having to change and have Kat go on back. Okay. Right now. Um, no problem. It's freezing. One moment. Okay, thank okay. you. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. What's important about the statute, judges could stop abusive litigation now, and they occasionally do. Sadly, I know victims who've had some of this done against them, um, and we, we're working ar around those issues. This statute would put in relief. It gives a structure for judges to decide, you know, what's abusive litigation, so you can point it out to them. Six complaints of modification in two years, Your Honor. And it has real relief. The court may dismiss the abusive action. They can impose costs, including but not limited to lost wages and transportation and child care every time you have to go back to court, attorney's fees, and most importantly, impose pre-filing or what's called gatekeeper. Next, please. This is a requirement that before they file something again, they have to take it to the judge or the judge may designate a clerk or somebody before they can institute a new filing. There's much more detail on this, but I just wanted to get the, that out, that there is relief. Next, please. So the action steps that we want people to take and go back on this in the question and answer more is we want people to contact their state representatives and senators and ask them to co-sponsor. The bills and the numbers will be on the Jane Doe website. Next, please. This can be just a simple call. Dear Senator so-and-so or an email, use the names and docket numbers and say, please co-sponsor this bill, docket number X, or this bill, docket number Y. You can add more information as to why you think these are important, of course, but legislators, if they get a few calls or emails, it makes the bill stand out from the 7,000 bills that are filed each year. Next, please. And for some people who may not know who their reps and senators are, and this will go on the Jane Doe site as well, this is how you find it out. You can go to the Secretary of State's, you fill in your information, and it gives you the names, and you can click right on the name to give you the telephone and email. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm so pleased to introduce Mei Ling Ellerman. Mei Ling, as you can see, is a gender and human rights expert. She's done research around abuse, I'm particularly looking at survivors of color. I've worked with Mei Ling on a number of things for, well, since before the pandemic, so it's been a while. And I'm so pleased to turn the uh, podium or the screen over to Maylene. Thank you so much, Janie. And thank you so much also to Jane Doe and the Mass Law Reform Institute for the opportunity to present today. I'll be speaking about coercive control over women survivors of color in Massachusetts, 
the obstacles to help seeking from the courts and police, and also how survivors of color will benefit from these bills. I've conducted interviews with African American or black women survivors and Chinese women, immigrant women survivors as well. Both encounter coercive control that becomes all the more dangerous because many of them encounter bias when seeking help. Their abusers also take advantage of these biases and stereotypes to demean and disempower their victims when they're entrapped. The abuse frequently continues post-separation, particularly when children are involved. Many abusers who share custody leverage implicit gender, racial, and ethnic biases to extend their control over their adult and child victims. Without a coercive control lens and related protective legislation, coercive controllers can often get away with long-term abuse and the victims remain without protection. I will start by discussing Chinese immigrant survivors' experiences. In our society, there are common stereotypes that objectify and dehumanize Asian women. The gendered racism can result in domestic abuse being trivialized or dismissed. One survivor experienced such frequent abuse at one point that she was calling the police every two weeks or so. She was nearly suicidal because the police and courts had failed to help her. Once when the police responded to her call, she overheard one of them saying, I'm tired of these domestic violence calls, they're boring. And that I want something bigger, like a shooting. At other times, the male officers indicated that they were tired of her frequent calls. These comments told her that those who were supposed to protect her weren't really thinking of her as a human being, that they don't think that domestic abuse is a big deal. Immigrant survivors face culturally specific obstacles to help seeking. This includes a lack of knowledge about the US laws and customs, the lack of familial and other support networks, dependence upon their coercive controller for immigration papers, bank and phone accounts, and language barriers. These obstacles make it that much easier for coercive controllers to isolate and control their victims, and also to deny them the resources that they need to escape. I will share the case of one survivor. We will call her Anna. She was a successful, wealthy businesswoman in China, wealthy enough to buy her own home in Shanghai. She was engaged to an American and she immigrated to the US right before the pandemic. She ended up what she called a house slave. Anna experienced extensive psychological abuse, gaslighting, blame, lying, and other non-physical forms of coercive control most of the time, but she was also physically abused. He would tell her that because she's a foreigner, she's nothing and that she doesn't have legal rights. He told her that she needs to leave her Chinese ways behind. Anything that he wanted to justify, he called American, such as getting text messages day and night, which turned out to be because he was having multiple affairs. She didn't have a work visa and only her husband earned income. Yet he refused to give Anna money to pay for their apartment and other expenses. She had to use up all her own savings. He justified this financial abuse by saying, this is how Americans do it. She told me, I feel like he controls me. He said, I'm your husband. You need to listen to me. You need to obey my rules. And she didn't understand why. He controlled where she went, isolated her so she couldn't make friends. And he told her that everything happening to her was all her fault. When she shared how she felt, he would dismiss it. And she said that she is faking it for attention. One day out of the blue, he suddenly told her that he had divorced her, that he didn't wanna see her anymore and she should pack up her stuff. She was blindsided and she didn't know what to do. So she packed her bags and she said she was going back to China. This had actually been an, an attempt to destabilize and terrify her. So her decision to actually leave meant that he was about to lose control of her. And that is the most dangerous point. Instead of letting her leave, he took her passport, pushed her down on the bed and started choking her till she lost consciousness. When she came to, he said, this is your fault, you made me do this. I've never heard a woman like this, you made me do it to you. She was finally able to escape after being taunted and pushed to the edge until she cut herself and she was taken to the hospital against her abuser's wishes. So here we have seen how a coercive controller was able to hold this capable and resourceful woman captive, leaving her with depression, PTSD and night terrors, a shell of her former self. 
Now I will turn to the experiences of African American or Black women survivors and their challenges in accessing help from the courts and police, which include bias and stereotyping. We need to consider the historical context of how Black women have been portrayed since the time of slavery. Many of the stereotypes perpetuated to main control over Black women are still alive and well. We still have racist gendered stereotypes about the sapphire or the angry loud Black woman, the hypersexualized Jezebel stereotype, the emasculating matriarch. These can lead to assumptions that Black women are complicit in domestic abuse and that they do not sound or act like victims. One survivor named Camille told me, I don't think people realize that they are playing into society's unfairness and expectations that Black women are supposed to go through this, that somehow we deserve abuse. I will share a second case study with you. This is a, the experience of a survivor who chose the pseudonym of Lady Rage. She went to the district court for the fourth time to apply for a restraining order. If she didn't file for an order to protect her children, they threatened to file a 51A for a charge of child abuse or neglect. She was forced to leave her children at home so that they would not hear the testimony. While she was waiting for her abuser to be transported to the courthouse, her son injured himself. When she informed the judge that she needed to go take care of his son, he told her sternly, if you want this restraining order, you are going to stay here and wait for it. I'm not calling this case before he arrives at the courthouse. So you can either do it my way or leave. She told me, and I was there till five o'clock. He called my case last. And this was long after her abuser arrived and her son had been injured. She said, the judge kept asking me the whole time whether I wanted to go through with the restraining order. He called me up to the front and said, listen, I understand that people get into these little arguments over the weekend because you're all drinking. He said, this sounds like a little argument that went a little too far. Are you sure you want to do this to the rest of his life? So this judge not only actively advocated for her abuser, drawing on gendered and racist stereotypes, but filed a 51A anyways. He only granted her a six month restraining order and only because her sister had recorded her abuser's death threat. Because of gendered racism, survivors of color really have an uphill battle to obtaining help. If they don't look like a typical victim, if they're thought to be complicit in the violence, if they're seen as low status and less deserving of help, then they may be blamed, disregarded, or expected to show more severe injuries to qualify for that help. If the 209A maintains the narrow definition from 30 to 40 years ago, then judges and police will continue to look primarily for isolated examples of physical or sexual violence, disregarding the abuse and control that may happen most of the time. Well, if the 209A is amended, then survivors of color can document detailed patterns of behavior that occur over time. Even if they encounter bias, they would have far more evidence to prove that they had been coercively controlled over time and also that they have other valid reasons to fear their abusers. It would improve their ability to protect their children who are also likely victims of coercive control. And last, a change in definition would lead to a change in public consciousness. Once survivors understand the many forms of abuse, control, coercion, isolation, intimidation, and more that make up a pattern of course of control, then they can finally start to make sense of their experiences. And they can try to leave, possibly even years earlier than they might otherwise. Thank you. One second, we're going to be changing interpreters.
Go ahead. Thank you all so much for that wisdom that you shared. I think this has been so remarkably helpful to all who came to today's presentation. I know there are lots of good questions in the chat. Um, and Nithya, I want to hand it to you because I know you've been um, going through a few of them to uh, begin to highlight a couple themes that might be helpful for us to address. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks so much for all your questions. Um, I think the first one we'll ask Jamie or Hema or anyone else who wants to step in, but it's about the specifically the wording of the bills. So how is the wording of these bills in Massachusetts worded so that course of control and litigation abuse is not weaponized against victims like we currently see today? That is a really important question. And we drew upon statutes in other states or the representatives and senator statutes in other states, but also a recent model code by a group of national experts. And we changed the language this year to emphasize more the issue of patterns and the protection about things that are done to protect children. It is not perfect. There is no legislation that is not perfect. There is no legislation that abusers do not use against survivors. So we know that they lie and we know that they can take an example and blow it up. So it is important to have the, the language in the statute now is as specific as we believe it can be done and emphasizes the issue of patterns. It is reassuring if I've been reading the chat that People have talked to people in California, uh, Connecticut, places that already have this. It is not new. And while there are clearly issues, um, and particularly a number of people mentioned parental alienation syndrome, and that's like a whole nother layer of, which would take me two hours to cry about and tell you about, but they haven't been seeing this backlash. It's also, been in Scotland for a number of years. So we're looking at those and looked at those things and the sponsors of the bill to try to limit this. And there needs to be a lot of education. Um, and I know education, somebody said, education doesn't matter. And to some extent, they're right. Judges take the bench, having spent 40 years in our society. So they come on with a lot of notions of what they think a family is or isn't. But education does something. And by naming these things about the abuse of litigation and the course of control, it gives survivors tools. If you haven't named it, how can you explain to a judge why, yes, he hit me a year ago. I didn't come in then, but I'm in now. May I add on to that, Nithya? Yeah. Um, I have been testifying in cases across the country. In some states, they have legislation on course of control, and in some, they don't. In all states, abusers will try to pretend that they are the victims. They'll do a DARVO, you know, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender, and try to, you know, make the courts believe that the victim is actually the offender. So that's happening now. But I think legislate, I think that education, like Jamie mentioned, happens not just through formal programs as it should, but it also happens each time someone brings one of these cases to court and writes an expert report or testifies, or the victim describes what's going on. Um, you know, sometimes these, these accusations are, are really laughable. Um, you know, you may have somebody, well, one person lives in fear and the other doesn't, and that's obvious. So I, I think that certainly these having these laws offer better protection than not having these laws. And just look at like the abuse of litigation. Yes, this judges are already putting in gatekeepers against survivors. We're hoping that having this language will not only tell a judge what it is, but will tell a judge what it is not. 
I'd also like to add something. I, you know, I think this these questions, all all that all of you who've raised this have been really at the core of our discussions since this topic was, you know, even began to emerge uh, probably early last year or the year before um, in Massachusetts conversations. And we had a number of conversations with our membership. Um, we held several listening sessions to really hear from from member programs and and allies. You know, what 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 are you seeing? Is this an issue of interest? What are survivors you're working with uh, saying about this? And the issue of retaliation did come up over and over again. And at the end of the day, I think to to Jamie's point there was a sense of the importance of having protections like this in our civil protection order specifically, um, felt like it outweighed, you know, with the proper scaffolding, with the education, it outweighed some of the potential for harm. Um, so, so I think that that is something that is a kind of a push and a pull here um, that we need to uh, really, really reckon with. Um, in this moment, and, and where we have landed is that th these civil protections, the fact that it would open up the possibility of protection for many more survivors felt like it would really meet an important need. And I know that some states have gone in the criminalization direction, and that brought us uh, extensive, many, many concerns because we are in a state that does not even have comprehensive, uh, medically accurate uh, sex, sex ed and relation, healthy relationships education. And, you know, the, the possibility of criminalizing this kind of harm was of concern to us, which is why our focus is really on the civil protection aspect at this stage. Thanks, everyone. I think there were some questions about, you know, data collection and the implementation of this. So there was a question, how are we going to address the family court judges in some jurisdictions that do not want to change the ways of enabling abusers? Will there be any audit system in place of the courts to collect data? We've been talking about audits and we've been talking about court watches and trying to, and, and it's very difficult. You go to the chief justice and you say, X is happening. And they say, well, give me the case docket numbers and, you know, and we'll, and what the recordings are. And there are a lot of victims who know that they are continuing the litigation and the judge is going to be pissed at him. So we're trying to see of ways to bring this to the judges. But as I said, I have, I'm sort of over educating to get better judges. I'm into educating to get better litigants so that they can argue their cases in a better way. But we're continuing and we, we've seen a drop off. Jane Doe did listening sessions and they're still going on about actions in um, district court. And we're hoping to come up with a report for that. And I know many of you participated in that. But yes, and it's we live in a data-free zone when you come to the courts, and so it's very difficult. But we're trying, and we would invite anybody who has thoughts about this to reach out to Jane Doe, and we can do more discussions and listening sessions to think about what are the ways we can do this. Uh, Chief Justice Casey has met with people from uh, Jane Does Well. He meets regularly with family law lawyers um from legal services but it's a problem because kind of the good judges don't know how bad the bad judges are and they think oh everybody's like me everybody's exaggerating so it's it's difficult so i'm not going to give you an easy answer but we're definitely thinking about that one other thing i i know <laughs> i'm sorry um there have been some questions about documenting and collecting evidence um and how to do that and how to do it safely there are amazing advocates on this Zoom, people I've known for many, many years. And I think reaching out to your domestic violence providers can help you create a safety plan, but also 
discuss how to safely do this. Um, that could be a day-long seminar, and maybe we should do that next, Tama, um, on that. Um, people also asked about how do I help a friend who I think is in coercion and control, and that's really tricky, but I'll, sort of like Al-Anon for people who live with alcoholics, many domestic violence advocates have thought deeply about this, so I think reaching out to them, and I'm so proud of the survivors who are on this because this is really hard. And I am so proud of the advocates. I'm old, 40 years ago, there were no advocates in the court. Things were much worse. I think probably Mayling and I can address that question of how to help someone who you feel is in a course of control relationship as well. I mean, for me, the number one, and, and I echo that going to your local domestic violence agency, contacting them, it should be the first step. Um, there are also wonderful materials on the website of domesticshelters.org in terms of how to collect evidence. They have a resources area and how to collect evidence, how to help someone, and so on. The number one thing that I recommend is finding a way to stay in touch and that doesn't mean you have to be talking about the abuse or the suspected abuse all the time, but do what you can to not allow the person to get isolated. Um, if you can get some time alone with them, that's great and reflect to them what a wonderful person they are. Help them remember that people appreciate them and like them and they're not um, you know, worthless and a bad person as the abuser keeps telling them. I wanted to, I have more, but let me ask Mei Ling if you have any suggestions there about what people can do to help. Yeah, yes, I definitely do, thank you. Uh, I think that if you are able to talk with your friend or family member about what has actually happened, that it's incredibly helpful to start talking about the different categories of abuse and control so they can start to fit together the tactics. And so a pattern can emerge, they can understand the impacts why they're so confused. They can understand how their children are being coercively controlled, what the impacts are on their children, why their children ally themselves with the abuser and perhaps you know act out with them instead with a safe parent because they feel that they are safe with that parent and can show their emotions. They need to be able to get some psychological distance to, to objectively see, to think about everything that's happening as a tactic. Otherwise, it's very easy to continually get pulled back in to believe what the abuser is saying. And to and I, I think that this is part of the reason why so many survivors, why it takes so many times to leave, um, so many attempts to leave. I also want to say lawyers need education. Many of you have probably talked to domestic relations lawyers who have no idea about this. So that's sort of another step that needs to happen. And, and unfortunately, the time to get the best advice is right upon the separation or divorce, because if you're coming back a couple of years or 10 years later to modify, it can be much more difficult. Um, and that's a hard time because the survivor is typically um, confused, overwhelmed, often broke. Um, but that would be the time where it's important to get a, get a good attorney and get a good team if possible. One moment, please. We're going to switch interpreters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think there was some... Um, clarification questions regarding 209A protection, what that means um, in the civil and or criminal context. So I was wondering if Hema, you wanted to go more into that. Um... Yeah, glad to. Can you just uh, clarify more just what is the 209A? Yes, process? just is going that... over what 209A protection means in the civil context and whether this bill addresses the civil or criminal uh, context for 209A protection. Sure, sure. So, and, 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 you know, Jamie, feel free to jump in as well. I mean, I think 209A is, for in shorthand, Massachusetts Domestic Abuse Restraints. It's our abuse prevention uh, statute. And 
what what this does is, you know, as commonly referred to as a restraining order or a protection from use order, um, this this what what this particular change would do is broaden what is recognized as a basis for protection under our 209A statute. So that means, um, you know, including uh, basically changing from the current standard, which would require uh, harm or imminent fear of imminent harm to a much more comprehensive definition that contemplates uh, everything that was talked about here today, looking at really the the dynamics and the comprehensive dynamics of coercive control, um, as well as technological abuse as well. Um, so, so that's the purpose of including it into an INA. It is civil and not criminal. However, the, this is always a, a tricky place for those of us kind of talking about um, you know I think this field as a whole has begun to really you know grapple with what it means to rely so heavily on a uh, criminal legal system responses, certainly at JDI, that is something that we are thinking quite critically about. Um, if a protection order is violated, that can lead to criminal consequences, right? That that is that is kind of a so it is a civil order. Um, and and to the extent that that civil order is is complied with, it remains civil. Um, if there is a violation, it could turn into a criminal matter. So that that's a little bit of context around um, civil what what the 209A piece means. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, JB. I, I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> if I may. Um, and May Ling might as well. I appreciate you're talking about that, um, Hema, Hema, how um the people who choose to violate civil protection orders may end up in jail or may end up with criminal charges. Um, sometimes what I hear when people talk about that is the thought that therefore women should not get protective orders or should not press charges. I don't think that's what you're saying, but but I do hear people saying that and I do hear a lot of people feeling like they're a snitch if they seek protection from, for themselves. I think it's really important to note that um, women and children are being murdered, um, beaten, um, controlled, unable to work, et cetera. I don't think any of us supports the criminal justice system as it stands now. It is so imperfect. Um, but And some people don't access it at all because of, of how imperfect it is. But I just want to make sure that we're really careful not to sort of lay on to um, victims of domestic abuse that they have some obligation to put their bodies and their families on the line to protect somebody who is habitually and continuously and repeatedly harming them. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think that certainly my point is. I think all of us who do survivor-centered advocacy recognize that it is really important that survivors walk into any form of relief, really eyes wide open, right? That informed understanding of what legal processes mean. Because unfortunately we know, and certainly from the thread on this chat, that sometimes the system systemic harm, the harm caused by various court systems and judges can really create some additional trauma and burden. So really going into these processes, knowing what can happen, right, is, is just a really important component. And, you know, we make no, no judgment whatsoever on the, the choices that a survivor makes uh, to enforce a restraining order, to move forward with criminal legal system processes. Those are very hard and important decisions that are very individual to every survivor. And there are many survivors for which that is simply not a safe option for a number of reasons. So I think that it's it's really a, a matter of kind of the both and of holding that space here and naming the complexities are really critical. Thanks, Saul. I think there was one specific clarifying question on uh, the terms of the orders. And then after that, I wanna get 
into advocacy and what people can do for next steps. So I think Jamie is question for you. Will the categories or terms of orders be changing with this legislation? For example, right now there is no abuse, no contact, et cetera. Will those remain the same or might the order be tailored to the types of control the victim is seeking protection from? The reliefs will be the same. It's up to determine how those can meet the, the needs. So I think it's, it's not going to change the relief, but I think within the advocacy community, if these bills pass, we need to start talking about what, how you can use those reliefs against these particular crimes. But no abuse and lack of contact and uh, technological restrictions all will, will be able to be used for this. I'm not sure if that's a great answer, but I know who asked that question, Joanne, and we could talk about that more at another time. Well, thanks, Jamie. I think with our, we have seven minutes left, so I'd love for everyone to talk about more ways that we can advocate, how everyone in this uh, room right now can advocate with us for whether it is um, getting this bill passed or more advocacy and more awareness on course of control. So if each one of you can take on this question and talk about specific ways we can advocate, that would be wonderful. Maybe we can start with Lisa. Sure, I'll start and I'll be brief. Uh, I think it's really important to educate ourselves and each other about course of control. There's a lot of writing available on the web. Um, I wrote a book on course of control. There's Emma Katz's book on course of control in the lives of children. Um, and there are also, in addition to this webinar, there are webinars that are available on YouTube on course of control. So I think it's really important to educate survivors, attorneys, advocates, each other, family members, and so on, so they can know how to connect the dots that's really the beauty of thinking about the term course of control is it that it connects the dots between all these different um, kinds of abuse. I think that there are films that illustrate course of control and there are films that are really um, retrograde and, and set us back. Um, so I think that we can use films also to start um, discussions. And I'm going to leave it. I, I encourage people to write to their local newspapers about this up, upcoming legislation. You know, just a couple of paragraphs um, alerting people uh, to the fact that it exists. For what local newspapers are left, people read those cover to cover or screen to screen. And so I think that is really, and if you're interested, but you don't know what to say, We'll we'll come up with some sort of template letters or information that we can share. Um, I want to reiterate what Lisa said about educating everybody, because it's not just the judges. I mean, it's what people feel in their hearts. It's what everybody grows up thinking. Um, and educating police, somebody mentioned, is really important. And this is one area as bad as they may be, they're actually better than they were 40 years ago, believe me. Judges seem to be going backwards. That's what's a grave, grave concern. Um, yeah, not sure. Also, there is a statewide network of survivors and advocates, but really working for survivors, that's being created to, to do advocacy on this. And we will provide on the Jane Doe uh, site. Yeah, I'm telling him and Nithia what they're going to do <laughs> on the site, um, how people can get in touch with that. And we're doing monthly meetings and we have a plan working with the Mass Family Family Coalition. I'm sorry, I may have your name wrong. I'd like to see. Now see, to get Lisa's book into the hands of every legislator. Yes, if I could also mention something. I think uh, one, I know that JDI is going to do a lot and I'm sure that Hima will speak about it, but I'd also like to mention that the Mass Family Advocacy Coalition, um, we are going to start up a Facebook group to help organize survivors and advocates uh, to push for this legislation. And I completely agree with 
uh, Lisa's comment on really not educating our, not only educating ourselves, but also our communities. So you could share these webinars and information with, as um, Jamie suggested, the police. Um, you could share it with faith-based organizations, with your communities, with your children's school counselors, uh, principals, um, other staff, because there are almost certainly children in every classroom who are impacted by course of control. And the sooner that we can educate the community, help survivors and their children, we also have a far better chance to interrupt this cycle of intergenerational abuse and trauma. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing. Somebody was talking about education for the judges. Um, and somebody mentioned Caden's law. Um, we already have laws in Massachusetts to do much of what Caden law does. How effective they are is a question. There is a requirement for every other year training of everybody around domestic violence in the court system. And that did happen um, 2019, I believe. Um, it was very good. They went around to every courthouse and did these comings and goings. And then we we're starting to work on the sexual violence training and it all got upended um, through the pandemic and fighting to get that back on is something that a lot of people are doing. But every year there are district court and probate and family court conferences and there almost always is something and all the judges have to go to those. Um, how much people take in is the question because they come in, as I said, with the whole history of what they believe. And every day the judges are hearing bad things time after time and they start shutting down. So I have a whole other theory that people shouldn't be judges for more than 10 years, but we won't go there. So it's, it's a difficult issue. And there are 120,000 cases filed every year in the probate and family court of which probably, 80,000 of those are related to divorce or paternity or modifications or custody. So there are a lot of cases with very little time and not enough resources to help people. Um, and there clearly are not enough lawyers. Legal service lawyers turn away 50% of people who are victims of abuse and meet the incredibly low income standard and they still can't be helped. So. Well, I just want to thank each of you for such wisdom today. Um, this has been so informative and we are at time. Um, I do see uh, the staff, many folks from our legislature in the on the participant list, um, folks from the Judiciary Committee, thank you, thank you for being here and for participating and listening to us today. Uh, in terms of the what's what's coming up next, um, there are many many things. Right now, we are in the information building space. We're we're building we're building a movement and building a coalition around this important issue. Um, there will be um, as this bill progresses through the legislature, there will be many many opportunities for each of you to get involved, uh, to share your stories and experiences, to reach out to your legislators to reach out to your communities and networks to really speak up and have, have everybody reach out to your legislators to talk about what an important issue this is to you. Um, we will be soliciting testimony from anybody who wants to be sharing that. Um, that is a very important phase in the legislative process to be able to uh, share why this is impactful and necessary in Massachusetts now um, with the committee that will be hearing hearing these bills. Um, so there are many steps along the way to get involved. We encourage you to reach out and we'll certainly do a follow-up email to all registrants about how to continue to get involved. And we um, really just appreciate all of you for your time today. We wanna thank our interpreters for all of your hard work and our captioner. And 
um, to everybody who made this possible. And Dr. Fontes and Mei Ling and Jamie, thank you for just uh, sharing all, all the wisdom that you hold and pushing this conversation forward. Thank you, Hema. Thank you, Nithya. Thank you, Jamie and Mei Ling for your wisdom and uh, what a great opportunity. And thank you, Jane Doe Inc. for everything you do for victims and survivors in our state every single day. Thank you. Thank you all.